This episode of Talk Your Book is proudly brought to you by Honan, providing a complete range of insurance, risk, and financial solutions. Bundy's called me up, told me to take a look, but stay stubborn as bulls and talk their own book. Get the money, get the money, get, get the money. Well, Tom Waterhouse, mate, thanks very much for coming on Chris Judd's Talk Your Book. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, good to be on. Mate, I thought before we get into your, your stock pick, we'd start with Waterhouse VC, which is um, look looks like an incredible fund from the outside. But why don't you tell me the, the genesis story of Waterhouse VC and, and what you guys look to invest in? Yeah, look, the, the family's always been, well, over 100 years, been in the gambling industry. And, and I was an on-course bookie. I had TomWaterhouse.com. It grew really fast and we sold it to William Hill. And then I ran that business in Australia for four years and, and saw how this global... Uh, multinational global betting businesses operate and all the different companies they have to interact with. And, and so in 2018, bought back TomWaterhouse.com and thought, well, I can't go into betting for a couple of years. What am I going to do? And, and thought, well, the family always invests in gambling businesses, but there's this ecosystem of um, businesses that provide services to the gambling and, and gaming industry. Um, why not focus on those? And and sort of it's, it feels like quick, but it actually took a long time to set up a fund and to go through all the process that you have to go to. And, and that sort of was the beginning of it. And, and at the same time, the US opened up and, and really our focus is just on the B2B providers, the, the providers to the gaming and wagering big operators and just focusing on those businesses and, and trying to find businesses that um, the market hasn't found yet. You know, it's, it's easy to analyse a crown or a, a tab call, but it's a bit hard to analyse uh, the services that they use. You know, n- not every analyst knows those businesses. So it's a really concentrated strategy in terms of gambling, but you've got a couple of other businesses and assets in there as well. Maybe tell us some of the other companies slash assets that the funds invested as well. Yeah, look, so there's not always, we sort of focus on the 100 million to 300 million market cap businesses um, and that are providing services, but we don't always come across ones that we want to invest in that we get. We think we're getting value. And so if, when we've got excess money, we don't want to leave it in cash or a large proportion in cash. So we're going to some of the larger operators. So we're in Flutter, um, which owns FanDuel and Sportsbet and Betfair. Um, we think for the B2C operators that scale is so important. And we think that they're a, a dominant scale operator globally. And so we're happy to, to sort of park money in those sort of stocks, but it's not really our edge because they're much easier to analyse and understand from an analyst point of view or, or broader investment community than uh, our sort of skill set, which is really understanding the, the nuts and bolts of, of what happens in the gambling industry or, or, or the services the gambling industry needs. And we'll get on to your stock in a minute, but we, we do open up opportunities for humble brags at, at Chris John Invest. So tell me, Tell the viewers your returns since you've uh, since you started the fund because they're pretty incredible. Yeah, well, look, our first investment, which we're going to cover, Betmakers, has gone. We got in quite a few years ago, and, and it's gone really well, and, and that's sort of um, made the fund go go great. It's been a big part of it, but also our sort of top eight or ten investments have all had a great um, uh, a great period over the last two years, and it's not really our. Um, like we're not like some amazing, like we're just starting out, but the US opening up has made that all of the, uh, like this industry has really gone gangbusters over the last two years. So we've had much better than we ever expected returns. Like I think investors of, I don't know, 15X or 20X, something, I don't know, some like a number, but it's, we've, it's been luck of timing. You know, obviously we know the industry really well and I hope that over a 20 year period we're going to perform very well, but it, like who would have thought that the US is going to open up and open up at the, at the pace that it has and that, uh, you know, the one industry I know is is the hot industry at the moment, you know, globally. And so, um, but yeah, if, if I could replicate these a few more years, I, I'd be, yeah, I'd be amazing. But it, yeah, Past performance isn't necessarily an indicator of future performance. Well, yeah, 100%, 100%. But look, uh, if the US hadn't opened up, I'd be very confident with, the strategy for myself because I know the industry really well and I keep it tight into the one industry that I know. Far too humble for my liking. But uh, Betmakers is a stock we're going to talk about. For those that haven't heard of Betmakers before, and uh, 
I'm, I'm on the register, so we'll get that, that out of the way as well. Uh, what do they do? Look, they uh, provide services to the wagering and uh, operators and, and also the racing body. So they're basically the middle uh, guy of the racing industry. So if you're, um, uh, call it lab brokes or sports bet, um, your fixed odds racing data, a lot of those information comes from bet makers. And if you're one of the, the racing bodies globally, you're getting integrity data and information about what's happening on those fixed odds uh, and also collection of fees in some jurisdictions from bet makers. So they're the middle man of global racing wagering data. And, um, and they also have a, um, some managed services business. So they have a platform um, business where they enable smaller operators to use their platform. They manage uh, risk for those operators. Um, they integrate vision services and other different services for those operators. And, and they also um, bought a, a, a tote business, this Vortec business, which has a global tote business as well. So they're really um, an integral part of the, of the global wagering industry because they are the middleman of, of basically racing um, on a global scale. And you mentioned US gambling at the, at the, uh, at the beginning and the deregulation or legalisation of fixed odds and sports spending over there. Where are we up to with that deregulation and, and what are the next milestones you're expecting to happen over there? Well, for, you've seen the sport in that New Jersey opened up in 2018 and then you've seen in different forms um, that if the next states, probably 19 states now, have all opened up in different ways. You know, so some have got eye gaming, some have got sports betting, some have just got uh, like... Uh, still got obviously a lot more have just got fantasy um, sports. But for the racing or for bet makers, New Jersey was really that first milestone, similar to sport back three years ago in, in 2018. And that um, they got a deal with Monmouth Park, a 10-year deal last year, but that had to go through all the regulatory process of going through all the approvals and, and get written into law, which has just come about in the last month. So I think that's a really big milestone for the company because now that you can legally take fixed odds bets in New Jersey, um, it's a blueprint of what other states can do. And the thing that's been uh, so complimentary is I actually think it's a complimentary product to the racing industry in the US because bet makers want the tote product because they own Sportec to prosper and they want fixed odds. So they're, they're very much alive for the racing industry to grow those revenues. And, and I think once the other states see that and see uh, the growth that I believe that the racing can generate and, and bet makers can generate in the US, I think those other states will quickly come as well. And um, it's, it's pretty exciting. And I think it's it, obviously sports is huge in the US, but the problem in the US for the operators there is, is twofold at the moment. It's very costly to get new customers. And also the margin is quite low as compared to the US and, and the UK. And that's because uh, they don't have a lot of racing product, which in Australia, that's a 10% plus margin product. And in the UK, they have such a big amount of turnover on soccer, on football, which has the draw. So it's a, a 9, 10% margin product. Over there, it's a lot of head-to-head -head markets on sport, which you're talking a 3 to 5% margin product. So I think racing and the operators there will be very interested in having racing product that's packaged very nicely, which bet makers will do. And also it will be a product that they'll want to promote because it's a much higher margin product. And also there's big gaps in the US season. It's a, it's a real product filler as well. So uh, I'm, very, um, I'm very bullish for racing. I'm very bullish for racing globally, but I think it's, it's underestimated what it can achieve in the US. And how long do you think it'll take before every state has legalised gambling or almost every state? Is it a two-year thing? Is it a five-year thing? Is it a 10-year timeline? What's your gut feel? I don't know. I, I, I just don't know. I, I, I've, I've been surprised with how quickly the pace of the state's opening up already. But I, I sort of look in, in Australia in, in when the likes of Mark Reed and these guys went to Northern Territory, they were real tra trailblazers in, in uh, the late 90s. And, and I sort of was at the track in 2001, 2003, and we were like, oh, we missed that boat to go to the NT and mm. they've already done it. But really the, the big sales and, and multiples in the Australian market didn't really sort of occur until 2013, 14, 15, 
Well, that was 15 years later. You know, advertising didn't properly open up till 2008. I sort of feel with the US, it's just the very, very beginning. And it's not a 15-year play like Australia in terms of that maturity. Because the states are opening up gradually, I think it's well, it's sort of the next 20 years is, is significant uh, events that will cause growth in the, in the US. And, and also um, the market there, I think, is you see um, analyst estimates, I think is quite conservative. You know, I, I, I think what's different about the US, I think that the chance of it being open from a racing point of view, an eye gaming point of view, a, a sports betting point of view, I think all of these things are on the table. And um, uh, I think the market could be surprisingly larger than, than what most are estimated. You see a $25 billion revenue market or whatever. Uh, that to me, it feels conservative, but I don't know timing, you know, whether it's two years, five years, 10 years. Those numbers that the analysts are putting out around future revenues from the US still have the, the average gambling amount of a, of a user nowhere near the amount that Australians gamble. Are we really high in terms of gambling per, per user around the world? Yeah, well, I think we're the highest per capita in the world. So here, call it, and, and these numbers, I think if you look them up, they're a few years old, but it's $25 billion of, of revenue in the gaming, wagering uh, space in Australia uh, uh, of revenue. Um, and call it sports betting is like four or five billion of that 25 billion. Um, but in Australia, you don't have any in-play sport available online, which is... Uh, a huge part of the turnover in the UK is predominantly in play sports betting. So we don't have that here. You have to have a telephone bet to, to, do, to do that. And we don't have any iGaming or online gaming allowed in Australia. So it's, yeah. it's basically $4 billion worth of revenue for online sports betting and racing. And then you've got a big chunk of lotteries and pokies and all the other stuff that are predominantly land-based. So I think it's... Um, I think this market, and we've seen with with in-play product and iGaming in certain states, I think that uh, 25 billion US total market, it seems conservative when I look at the Australian example and also the UK example. And talk to me about betmakers and, and their numbers. What's their market cap, maybe their revenue run rate and, uh, yeah. and their cash burn? So they're a bit over a billion dollars market cap. Um, their first... Um, they reported that their run rate of the first month or first few weeks was they're on run rate for around 70 um, million in revenue. Um, consensus is like 85 to 90 million revenue um, of, of, for, this, for this financial year. Um, look, they're a business, they're growing fast. Um, you might say, well, look, that multiple is, uh, depends on what type of business you're looking at is, is whether it's small or larger, I know looking at it compared to uh, competitors, like BetMakers doesn't have a, a racing data true competitor, I, I don't believe, but they have competitors that provide sports data and their revenue, their forward revenue multiples are somewhere between sort of 15 to 20. So I, I sort of think we're like a 10, 11 times revenue multiple, forward revenue multiple, and, and they've got 120 being in cash um, and their growth that they've seen over the last or year and a half, their business growing very fast. I don't think for a business that's growing that fast, the revenue multiple is, it's definitely not, uh, when you compare it to the, sort of the, the industry competitors, is, is not uh, not that one or not large compared to them. And, and obviously they've shown over the last two or three years um, uh, Todd Buckingham, the CEO, and, and the board, they've been very, very savvy with their acquisitions. So they bought Sportech basically for, for one times revenue, and they're trading at 10 times revenue. So it seems a pretty savvy buy. And, and they bought a feeds business a couple of year, years ago um, and Dynamic Odds, and they bought a, another couple of businesses um, which haven't been that expensive, but they're very savvy and I think they've shown great vision of what type of business are complementary into their ecosystem and finding them at, at value and being able to basically improve and enhance their, their existing business. At this stage of their existence, do you think revenue can grow 100% year on year for the next few years or is that too aggressive? Look, I think if they hadn't done the acquisition of Sportech, you could easily make the case uh, 
that they could grow 100% like they're, they're organic, their core business. But they're buying a mature, a more mature business in Sporting. I think that would be hard to grow the, the overall revenue in that way. But the, they may do that. But the, the reason why I say that is that I think that rather than generating significant growth of that, of that business, I think what they will be able to add an asset, the assets of those businesses are really strategically important for them. But um, yeah, I, the, the reason why we're not, we basically want to go into the business and we're long-term holders of a few key businesses we like in the sector. And the reason why we've been long-term investors of bet makers is that we believe that that racing data is very important. And the fact that they own uh, a platform they own the data, they, own, they have the relationships with the racing bodies, they have the integration already with the bookmakers, because I know from my time running William Hill in Australia here how hard it is to get into the product pipeline and to get integrated. The fact that they're integrated, they've got those relationships, and they've also got a very, um, a very, very uh, focused, incentivized team, you know, so that their, uh, their CTO or CIO, uh, long time part of the business, highly incentivized. Their CEO, founding CEO, really incentivized, focused, visionary of the business. COO they, they, is very also really onto it. I like that they, they've got these assets, but they've also got the uh, ambition to, to drive the business, you know, and, and that's, um, that's very important because you can have the assets and go, well, I'll rest on my laurels. They're a group of people that um, seem to be very focused on, on growth and making the, taking the most advantage of what this opportunity with the US opening up has given all of us, you know. And they touch almost every area of sports gambling from totes at racetracks to white label solutions for gambling platforms. What's the division that you're looking at most closely that's really going to drive growth for the next three, four, five years? The thing I like about what they've done, and, and uh, I think this is um, uh, Todd Bucking, the CEO on the board, and uh, Matt Davies, I don't know, Matt Davies has he, been a, a real, um, like, uh, amazing operator globally and, and has done amazing deals in the space. He understands the US landscape and uh, amazing, probably better than anybody. And they just realised, well, look, we want to be this business and this to in the ecosystem, how do we add assets to it? So whether it's their tote business or their, uh, or their platforms business or their feeds business, they're all complementary, you know, and they, they make each part of it better. And that, uh, I didn't, when they did the dynamic odds deal and the feeds business, I, I didn't see that, you know, I wasn't, I was, I thought they were nice assets, but I didn't actually understand and appreciate that, the asset they're building, they're, they're basically building a, a, a key asset for the wagering operators globally that they can link in and it improves their business. So it's complementary. If you take the feeds, you're hopefully going to drive more revenue from your customers and more engagement, and which in turn is better for bet makers, which in turn is better for the industry. You know, I, I love businesses where each part of the business improves off, off the other. You know, it doesn't take away. And so do you look at some of those old world assets, if you like, like the, the tote business or the, the, the businesses at casinos to provide uh, gambling on horse success? Are they dying business units or you can see them having a role long into the future? Obviously, there's been a massive shift away from land-based betting and, and you see the shift to, to online and the growth in online. And that's across not just wagering, that's across every, every industry. Do they play a, an important part going forward and are those assets valuable? Well, you've seen a lot of big tech businesses that have used land base well, you know, and, and enhanced their businesses. So I assume that they are, I, I can see that for us, our focus is on online business only. I think firstly, we see that they, they've got this um, tailwind of growth, which, which, is, which is always great. And also it's the area that I haven't been in, run a land based business, you know, so I, but I definitely think they. I believe that they have a part, and will will be for a long time to come. Whether it's through uh, customer engagement, brand awareness, uh, lots of different things like that. But uh, yeah, I, I don't know in terms of uh, it, it's not our core area of focus in terms of investing in the land based space. And talk to me about Matt Tripp's involvement because he's sort of a uh, a bit of a legend in the. Um 
in the Australian gambling business universe? What's his involvement uh, with betmakers and, and when did he get involved? Yeah, well, look, this was a game changer, I think, for the business because in, well, as you, you know, there's, I don't think there's anyone in the Australian landscape over the last 20 years that's been a better operator and, and more of a visionary entrepreneur than, than Matt Tripp in the space. You know, that what he was able to do with a multiple business over a long period of time, well, I've tried it myself. I know how hard it is. And he just, well, he just killed it each time, you know, and, and he's, uh, he's just a, such an important factor in whatever business he's part of in the Australian landscape. And, and to f- the fact that he uh, invested in the business and was part of that, um, that placement uh, and uh, at 70 cents and, and came on as a strategic advisor, uh, like betmakers have the assets, but to have the likes of Matt Tripp, you, you couldn't get anyone better in the Australian space. Matt Davey, in terms of the US space and uh, Todd Buckingham and, and the rest of the board that have taken this business from a startup to a billion dollar company. I, I really feel for the wagering and gaming sector, you've got the, the best, the best of the best. And, and Matt, um, uh, yeah, I, he, you couldn't ask for, yeah, he's, he's the best of the best here. So I think it's a big thing for, for bet makers. And, and definitely when I saw him come, as part of that deal, I was it was it was happy days in the office on that day. <laughs> and I'll I'll let you go in a minute, but for, for me it looks like it's you've got a picks and shovel type business for for wagering that's got heavy exposure to the US market in particular. There's a lot of other ways you could play the coming deregulation in US gambling markets, but for me the difference feels that bitmakers, you know, I look at something like a points bet who are going to have to spend so much on customer acquisition as they're competing with all the other gambling businesses trying to get a share of that market. Does it yeah. feel, is it, is it fair to say bet makers being more of a picks and shovel type business to those other competing businesses, yeah. their margins are going to potentially be a lot better if they do have a sustainable business down the track than those businesses that are constantly spending huge amounts on marketing. Is that fair? Yeah, look for, this is what we liked about the B2B operators and, and BetMakers is a good example. They've got 120 million in cash. That 120 million cash, if you're an operator, that burns very quickly. Like if you're spending only 120 million on marketing in the US, you're subscale. And so for an operator uh, like BetMakers, that 120 million doesn't have a high burn rate. Um, and they have that to place strategically where, wherever they think is appropriate. And that gives them a long runway, you know, that they're buying businesses generally not hugely priced and they're, it gives them a lot of time, a lot of runway and uh, where an operator, they're up against advertising costs, which obviously are skyrocketing because everyone's competing for scale and regulation, which obviously increasing taxes over a period of time. Now, that doesn't mean to say that uh, points bet and DraftKings and FanDuel, they're not great business to be invested in. You know, they, they and they've done like the, I, I used to work for the guys at points bet and the job that they've done. Been incredible, is, I agree. Yeah. Unbelievable. Like Sam Swanell is, yeah, I take my hat off to what him and the team there have achieved. And so then it's not to say that they're not great businesses to be invested in. It's just, I, I our main focus is to be because we feel we've got a strategic a strength in this area compared to a lot of other people analysing businesses, and and we feel that they're somewhat protected from the, from the regulatory uh, downside that can occur. My foils just dropped off a tie. He must have seen your tie and felt that I was uh, I was underdressed. <laughs> so I'll just quickly fix it up before the end of the show. Last question before I let you go: Is the tab deal done and dusted? It, it's forever i mean i know it's it, it's not going through in its current form and, and if it is where do you think they could deploy some of that 120 million down the track for for future acquisitions look the tab deal um i i listened to their um earnings call or their yearly call last week and, and they talked about how there were some key assets that tab have and and they'd like to keep ongoing conversations or they've got ongoing conversations and I can see a lot of the assets that TAB have make a lot of sense for betmakers in terms of either monetizing for them t- for the TAB or or bringing them under the betmakers umbrella. Um, I don't and I, with the 120 million, I don't know. I, I I take a lot of confidence, obviously, that Todd and, and the board 
they've done well in, I believe, in terms of the acquisitions they've done. They've shown that they've been very disciplined and buying it uh, at what I believe is value. You're not, not overpaying for assets and assets that a lot of the market couldn't see the value, but actually make strategic sense as part of that ecosystem. And also that they've got 120 million for whatever the likes of Matt Davy and, and Matt Tripp bring to the table, you know, like that. But, you know, I, I don't know what those will be. I'm, I'm just, uh, yeah, uh, waiting in anticip anticipation. Beautiful, mate. It's a, a, a great summary. Really appreciate your time and, and jumping on the show. And as a uh, as an albeit a small shareholder in bet, uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to the uh, the journey alongside you. Thanks very much. Yeah, true. Thanks so much. Thanks, Chris. This episode of Talk Your Book was proudly brought to you by Honan, who go beyond a transactional insurance broker to deliver better outcomes for their clients. If you're enjoying Talk Your Book, make sure you subscribe to Chris Judd Invest.